Thanks very much. Those things, those things always sound better when you read them than when you read them out loud. It's a little bit strange. So um, today I'm going to um, take you on a bit of a journey through my personal experiences um, in the creative industries. Um, share some of the work that I've been doing at the studio um, where I've spent most of my career, um, and then give a bit of insight um, in for those looking to um, start their own career. So where did it start for me personally? Um, it started with a, a Betamax player. The click is a bit slow. A fork. <laughs> I'm going to use the keys and Star Wars. So basically, when I was about five years old, um, we'd recorded um, A New Hope off the telly. Um, our Betamax player uh, re rewind function didn't work, and I used to watch it on repeat, and my mum had to rewind it at the end of the program um, with a fork each time. But I, w I was obsessed with the, um, with the spectacle and this, this faraway um, universe that had been created um, that I was able to um, transport myself to. So that's kind of that's always been a part of me, and I think that's kind of where I found my kind of love of visual effects, even before I knew really what visual effects were all about. So um, I went to Manor Comp uh, in Mansfield Woodhouse. Um, I uh, did A levels, and then um, I actually, whilst whilst I was there, I remember seeing this um, poster in the um, in like the careers room. And it was for uh, Bournemouth University, the National Centre for Computer Animation. And this was like one of the few places in the UK at the time um, that was offering um, a course dedicated to computer animation. Um, but I didn't do that great at my A-levels. I didn't quite get the points that I needed. So um, I decided um, to go to West Knotts College. Um, the art and design was down at the Chesterfield Road site um, when I did it. So in June 1999, um, I got my foundation studies in art and design. And then from that, um, I actually self-taught myself um, some really rudimentary animation and, and video editing and compositing skills. Um, and with that showreel, uh, managed to get into Bournemouth University, which was kind of my, my, dream, uh, my dream course. So really fortunate to kind of um, go on this path. Um, studied there. It was at a kind of a turning point where um, computer animation was starting to become very slowly, tentatively more accessible. So I actually learnt on SGI uh, workstations at, at uni in the lab, but actually we spent most of our time um, in, our, um, in our student residences with our own home networks, with our own PCs, which are actually more powerful than what they had at the university. We actually built our own render farm and our own local area network um, to do this kind of back in 1999 to 2002. So, um, what happened after university? Kind of my dream was to go to California, work for George Lucas on some new Star Wars film or whatever. Um, and th that was still the dream. Um, I managed to get a job uh, render wrangling at the moving pitch company um, in Soho on Wardour Street. Uh, worked on the second Harry Potter movie. And then after that, I, got, uh, I found out about this job at the National Space Center. So I'd kind of I'd been away from uh, the East Midlands for a while. Um, I'd never been to the Space Center, didn't know it was there. Uh, went up for this interview as a, a junior uh, computer animator. And they had this, this thing, this, this planetarium. I'd never actually been in a planetarium before up until this point. Um, and it was a new breed of planetarium, so it wasn't just dots on a ceiling from a, a star projector. It was a, this kind of infinite digital canvas. And at the time, kind of what they'd done in 2002, it was a bit rudimentary, um, but I saw this potential, and it kind of tapped into that desire for me to kind of create these awe-inspiring um, visuals. So I took the job, um, spent um, a few years kind of working my way through the ranks as, as an animator, as a, as a CG artist. Um, and then in 2008, um, I took over the studio and took it from a team of five people and then over the years grew it up to its peak of just under 30 people. So I'm going to talk about um, some of the projects that we've been doing um, over, those, um, over the last nearly 20 years. So um, kind of immersion, when we're talking about immersion, I talk about it in kind of many different flavors. 
Um, the most obvious ones are VR, but where we've spent most of our time creating works um, is in this um, shared immersive environment, um, um, these digital planetariums or immersive full domes. Um, as a studio, uh, I'd say primarily we're an animation studio, but um, we do basically everything from um, ideation and creative development all the way through to distribution and everything in between. So our, our first dome project was um, a real kind of mixed media project. We had some ex Ardman animators, we had stop frame animation in there, we had some uh, CG animation, we had 35 mil slide projectors to fill, fill the, ho the whole canvas of the dome. Uh, and so this was our first um, in-house production. And from these uh, early in-house productions, um, we made several of these, and they started to get a lot of interest internationally. As more and more museums around the world were going digital, it became practical to start to license these films. So we started to build a reputation uh, for these films. Um, along the way, we created a, a stereoscopic 3D ride um, for the National Space Centre, uh, which was really fun. That I was the stereoscope, stereographer on that project. Um, and then we made this uh, really popular at the time, a uh, 25-minute uh, uh, documentary all about the effects of human gravity on humans in space, narrated by um, Ewan McGregor, and that was a, a massive success. Um, and that basically started this new trajectory where we went from being an in-house team, um, just making things for the Space Center, uh, to doing it for clients all around the world. So we had a, we had a number of um, large commissions um, from America, um, and then Whilst doing these commissions, these work for hire projects, we also um, continue to do our own um, intellectual property, which we could um, license internationally as well. Um, in 2009, um, we did a film called We Are Astronomers, narrated by David Tennant. Um, that was really popular, celebrated the International Year of Astronomy. Um, and then we continued to explore um, stereoscopy, and we did a 4D ride. Uh, which you could smell the scent of the black rhino, um, you could smell um, the pine trees, and you got snow kind of blown in your face and rumble seats and stuff. So we designed all the, the media um, for this experience uh, up in Edinburgh. Um, this was back in 2011. We created this 9.5K video wall piece, which was all these this array of video, of, uh, video screens. And at, at the time, that was a quite... A, an enormous resolution, and up until that point, we've been working at um, 4K by 4K resolution, which uh, in this day and age doesn't sound like that much, um, but kind of 10, 15 years ago, that was um, a lot of data um, to, to manage and, and render. So you kind of see that comparison of where we were with that uh, resolution for that, that video wall. And then we started doing more and more international stuff. Um, we did a project in Cairo. Um, which involved a dome, so not just um, space. People often think we're based at the Space Center, we only do space. Um, but we have done many, many different subject matters, um, both educationally and also um, for corporate clients as well. Um, we did a project, uh, this, uh, these fog screens, so reprojected fog screens to kind of create this holographic illusion over um, a Basiliosaurus um, skeleton. Um, in 2012, we took everything we knew about dome and flat screen stereoscopy and kind of combined it uh, into the world's first panoramic uh, stereoscopic 3D planetarium show. Um, as some of these digital planetariums were starting to introduce um, 3D glasses, um, so we kind of pioneered um, a lot of the work in that area. Um, we tackled human biology, astrobiology. Um, we did um, a, a major project for the Google Lunar X Prize, which was telling their story um, about this amazing competition uh, where private companies were trying to land a rover on the moon. Um, unfortunately, it finally came to an end this year and nobody actually won it. Um, but in terms of the, the outreach show that we made, there was, this was seen in um, a thousand planetariums in 70 countries around the world. So we're really proud of the reach we managed to get with that project. We've done things for the European Space Agency, um, and more and more, we've started being involved in the whole kind of experience design. So not just the, the kind of the media aspect, but what it means to um, be part of this immersive installation. Um, we did a project for the ruler of Sharjah. So we've made projects for kings and, and princes um, around the world. 
Um, that was all about the origin of Islam, so a 25-minute documentary um, set to the Quran. So that was um, quite a departure from what we normally do, but it was kind of really fascinating working, working with this more cultural um, subject um, in this immersive medium. Um, we've created immersive, hands-on, uh, digital um, experiences as well. Um, we did this piece called Tomorrow Town for um, the world's l third largest elevator company, I think they are, where they um, put a, a dome in their showroom and commissioned us to make this story all about um, urban development of the future, trying to get away from this vertical infrastructure uh, and introduce a more human scale kind of city design. So it's all about using the, this power of immersion to communicate a message, whether that's education, um, whether that's trying to get across this kind of vision um, architecturally. Um, these immersive mediums are fantastic at doing that. And we, we updated that um, a few years later and did a major uh, motion control camera shoot. So um, we hired out this massive soundstage in, um, in London and we actually had to pay to have it painted green, which was quite expensive. You'd be surprised how expensive green paint is. Um, and we did this kind of multi-pass camera move um, and then integrated all those uh, live action elements into a CG environment to give us this kind of seamless fly in and out um, a camera move, which would, we wouldn't have been able to do any other way. Um, we started to go into theme parks and entertainment as well. So this was a, um, a nine-channel HD projection system 3D with motion platform vehicles in the middle. Um, so trying to figure out how the stereoscopic effect works um, when you move away from that kind of optimal eye point in the middle. That was a kind of lent on the R&D that we'd done with our previous work, and we were able to turn that project around really quickly. And then what we learned from the big budget um, theme park project, we were, allowed, we were able to apply to our own science center in Leicester, and we designed this um, mini immersive tunnel with a vibrating floor, full show control, um, ultra short throw projector so you can get really close. Um, and kind of create this really cinematic experience that was presenting the descent through uh, Venus in a, you know, a speculative kind of future, future mission. Um, so it's all about trying to combine this kind of leading edge uh, technology with creative storytelling. Uh, we've been working for Ferrari World over the last few years. Uh, we've done Q Media for the fastest roller coaster in the world. Um, we did a, this amazing kind of queue experience uh, for this new roller coaster a few years ago, um, which was all set on a World War I theme. It's quite random, kind of this World War I Ferrari theme, but there's this kind of connection with the yellow aeroplane and the Cavallino horse and Francesco, uh, this pilot who inspired um, Enzo Ferrari. Um, so this was basically a, a living, breathing kind of queue. I and mean, like, it sounds really like lame, oh, it's a queue, but... Um, it's not like when you go to Alton Towers and you've got like an LCD screen and you kind of see a little bit of something or other. This, we kind of created this living mural where it was a painted mural with over-projected animation. Um, and these planes kind of fly at you and then the sound, it's a whole room-wide sound system. They kind of rumble over your head. Um, and there was like a crash plane and we had all these projected face gags, Pepper's Ghosts, all kind of um, crazy stuff going on in there. Um, more Ferrari World stuff. And then VR, um, we're, re we're kind of really passionate about VR. We started using it um, when the first kind of new generations of the consumer headsets came out with the DK1 as a, as a production tool to help us pre-visualize some of these immersive sp spaces that hadn't been created yet, but we needed to get uh, an understanding of the space and design the media accordingly. Um, but actually using VR in its own right, we've worked on Google Expedition projects where we've designed uh, lesson plans. Um, We've done. We've worked with the UK Space Agency. Um, we actually got Tim Peake when he was up on station to film some material with a fisheye camera that they had up there. Um, but unfortunately, he put the wrong settings in the camera and it didn't quite turn out how we, how we wanted it. So we, we didn't really get to use that. But um, we managed to tell this story about living on the International Space Station. Um, and we reached a, a massive UK audience uh, with that. Um, we Are Stars was the first um, cross-platform dome and VR science documentary. So we launched this as a dome film um, up to 8K by 8K, 60 frames a second stereoscopic 3D for the, the very kind of best planetariums in the world. Um, but we also did um, a fully spherical 
360 video version for um, consumer VR. Uh, and that's available on Steam for all the tethered headsets, and we'll be launching it on the standalone devices um, later this year. We've also worked with, um, with installations to put this in as a, as, a, as a kind of a second ticket experience. So we built a VR cinema uh, with the Eden Project down in Cornwall, um, which has 25 synchronized headsets playing a special 10-minute edition of, of the film, which they ran last summer for their space program. Um, we also designed an immersive um, solar system safari uh, experience where we had kind of large-scale projection set design to create this kind of experiential um, journey through the solar system. Um, we've been looking at um, room-scale interactive VR in an educational setting as well, developing this virtual museum and how we can interact with um, artifacts and find new ways to uh, interpret them. Um, uh, Vestige is a, a recent project that I'm really proud of. Um, this is a complete departure from the science communication and entertainment stuff that we've done. Um, and it uses the kind of the volumetric nature of room scale VR to introduce a new spatial storytelling language. We explore multi narrative. Um, so the, the, the participant, the viewer, doesn't um, know that they have agency over the, over the experience, um, but throughout um, their journey through the, through the story, um, depending who they're looking at in terms of the characters in the piece um, and where they're standing three-dimensionally, it triggers different memories. So we have this kind of three-dimensional cinematography, and it also ties into this kind of fragmented um, story of, of memory. Um, it's, it's, quite, um, it's kind of quite a profound, beautiful story. It's about a woman whose husband kind of died uh, unexpectedly. Uh, it's all set to real testimony. Uh, I've got a little clip I'm going to try and show you. Um, we, we had our uh, world premiere at the Tribeca Film Festival in New York earlier this year. We uh, built this installation for it. Um, there's a tiny little clip here. If we backtracked a billion years, somebody will hold us to each other. So another innovative, so an innovative technique that we kind of introduced with this was um, volumetric capture. So this is kind of an emerging um, kind of state-of-the-art technology where, rather than just capturing, um, you know, video information, traditional kind of video information, we're also capturing depth information. So we can um, combine both the, the texture from the video information from the DSLR and the depth information, in this case, from a, a, a connect, and combine them, bring them into a real-time engine, and then allow us um, a new way to interact um, with, with the characters within the piece. So um, there are some limitations with this. So we chose this really strong art direction with the, with the kind of the line work, which tapped into kind of the essence of the story as well, of this kind of this memory landscape, um, but allows the, this, the viewer to kind of place themselves onto those characters within the world and become more present within the experience, but have a, a much stronger emotional connection to the story as well. Um, so we had our European premiere at Sheffield Documentary Festival a few weeks ago. Uh, we got the runner-up kind of special commendation behind the, the, in the VR section. So we, we're really proud of that. And we're going to be taking that to more festivals over the course of the year um, and at some point doing, doing a home release. And then uh, and then another project we're working on at the moment is the XR Museum. So this is um, taking all the we're, we're focusing on augmented reality at the moment, but it, it kind of considers all the different kind of XR tech that is around. To explore kind of like an on site and an off site experience for a museum.
So that's showcasing kind of the augmented reality device-based um, aspects of that. Um, and we're, we're going to be developing that over, over the next few months and really trying to figure out kind of what, what works and what doesn't um, in that space and what the language of augmented reality can be in a, an educational context. Um, it's, it kinda, it's, it's a nice, fun gimmick at the moment, but we're trying to see can we really add add more meaning and, and higher levels of interpretation uh, to some of those subject matters that we've tackled in 360 video and domes and VR. Uh, uh, this is just a few um, kind of concept art images of some of the things we're trying to introduce. So our rocket tower, we have two vertical standing rockets at the Space Center, but the Saturn V rocket, which put people on the moon, it was part of the Apollo program, is two and a half times bigger. So using this kind of sense of scale um, to try and show the audience something they wouldn't otherwise um, get an insight into. And so we did a, a photogrammetry scan of our Soyuz craft, which then allows us to show people where the astronauts actually sit. So whenever our visitors come around, they're always really interested to know what's inside it. And so with this technology, we can kind of um, have this kind of x-ray mode this, um, to allow people to experience things in a new way. Uh, we don't have an Apollo uh, lunar module, um, but we could potentially do a virtual exhibition of that. And then from an outreach perspective, um, going into schools or into communities, um, it allows us to kind of take the science and take the, um, take the museum experience out into those places and then hopefully encourage them to come and visit um, the, the sites as well. Um, we're working on a... Um, a simulated space mission facility at the moment, and as part of that, um, we're hoping to uh, create this XR lab, uh, which, will which will allow us to kind of co-create um, with the local communities, but also um, engage with uh, the kind of post-16 uh, educational kind of media students as well, um, and figure out how we can work together and share some of our experience in this immersive storytelling um, with people who are wanting to get more involved with that emerging technology. So that's something we're hoping to do um, over the coming years, um, I kind of got a few, I got a few um, comments or kind of statements or kind of meanderings on uh, my experience of kind of recruiting quite a few people over the years. So um, I reckon I must have looked at over a thousand, you know, thousands of CVs and hired about 50 people. So these are just kind of a few kind of random thoughts that kind of popped to mind when thinking about that that may be useful to consider. Um, yourselves. Um, I think it's becoming less, there are a lot of studios that are much more kind of cross-platform, um, that kind of cross-pollinate between different areas, and they're, they're kind of studios that I'm kind of really excited about myself. Um, but there are still these kind of traditional areas um, that, you need to con that you need to consider, uh, not necessarily make a decision on, but at least as a starting point, think about how your skills might map to one of those in, in particular. Um, but I think one of the key things is to maintain this open mind. Um, a lot of people kind of set out with those big ideas, like, you know, I wanted to go and work for Industrial Light and Magic, and, you know, maybe I will one day, but um, I think you have to look beyond Hollywood and AAA games and see some of those other opportunities, because actually some of those other opportunities um, can actually be much more um, compelling. So you, you kind of, you know, do you want the glory? Do you want kind of one of a thousand credits on the latest kind of Avengers film, or do you want to have some genuine job satisfaction where you can actually be part of a team um, th that makes a difference and you contribute um, to the creative output? And I'm not saying either one is right or wrong, but people do often kind of get blinkered with the bright lights of, um, of Hollywood and Soho and working in VFX or, or the big AAA games, but the reality of it is not always that exciting. And if it's something that you feel you need to scratch that itch and kind of go through that, then that's great. Um, but don't feel like that is the only path. Um, it, I mean, it's not going to be easy. Um, when I was starting out, there was, you know, not that many um, university courses and things doing this kind of thing. But now there are a plethora of, of kind of graduates um, doing this. So it's definitely not going to be easy. And that's where you really need to have this, this open mind um, about where you might be able to apply your particular talents and expertise. Um, it's maybe preaching to the converted for those that are already doing it, but when we're recruiting, we generally don't accept anyone who hasn't done a degree 
um, in, a, in a relevant field. So all of our junior positions, we would normally expect them to have applied themselves for that kind of minimum of three years to start to get to the point where they're approaching employability. Uh, make friends, I think this has been mentioned by other speakers, but that is absolutely critical. Kind of the amount of um, people that I know who have got jobs and throughout their careers through those kind of friendships and those networks is kind of the main way to kind of make, to get on in the industry. Um, I know that's kind of difficult because it can seem a little bit nepotistic sometimes, um, but it goes, you know, it goes in waves and generations. So, you know, be friends with everyone because you never know when they may be offering you a job or maybe making a recommendation f on your behalf. Um, it's a tough decision, especially when you're only just starting out and you haven't got wealth of ex a wealth of experience, whether to decide to be really specialist or to be generalist. Um, and it does depend on which sector you're, which targeting to how relevant this is. But um, I think try and be one or the other, which is kind of a bit of an obvious thing to say. But um, yeah, either be a specialist and be the best possible texture artist you can ever be, or be the best possible um, kind of sculptor you can be, or be really good and be a generalist. Like generalists are actually really valuable and often in very short supply. So um, if you're not particularly specialist in one area, being a really strong generalist is actually often in high demand um, in industry, especially for the smaller studios. Um, do your research on those potential um, employers. Um, not too much research, but um, definitely kind of know know what you're getting into, do, do your background, um, and, and contact studios that you love. Don't, don't feel that you're never going to get that opportunity, because you never know. You can catch someone at the right time, and they may just have an opening where they can offer a bit of help or a bit of insight um, or a job. And so there are those serendipitous moments. And so don't be afraid to say hello, share your latest work in progress. You may not always get a response. Um, but start those, start those dialogues um, and kind of focus on, on those people that you kind of um, respect the most and think are doing great work. And, and you never know where it, where it may lead. Kind of breaking the door down is probably a bit of a no-no, but um, you know, it, <laughs> if it works. And then create outside of education, or even if, you're, even if you're working, if you finish your education and you find yourself in a job that maybe you don't want to be in, but it's kind of a transition, kind of don't, don't give up on that, um, on that creative ambition because when we're hiring for junior positions, we want to see that people have kind of continued that passion and they haven't just given up. So even if it's just a little side project, um, it's great to see that you're still committed. So it's not like, oh, you graduated two years ago and you haven't done anything since other than um, a zero hours job because you have to because you have to survive, but find that time to keep keep going at what you're passionate about, and that will really serve you well um, if you manage to get that uh, kind of interview um, for, for a, a starting out position. Um, and as well, it, it doesn't have to be individual, like collaborate, you know, join teams, have these, you know, there's lots of people out there, there's lots of these challenges that you can get involved with. So, you know, get involved in one of those, and then you can share in that kind of group dynamic, which makes you even more prepared um, for the world of work, which is always a collaborative environment. So being able to showcase to a potential employer that um, you work well with others is a kind of a really key skill. Uh, make, make my life easy. Um, the amount of applications that I get where I have to go hunting for things, it kind of, it's almost, you know, you, often you just kind of give up because you don't have the time. Everything has to be kind of really succinct and in the right place and make sure that you've given that attention to detail on what is being asked of you within the application, because that is the first stage. If someone specifies, you know, no cover letter, no interview, then, and you don't provide a cover letter, then you've not had that attention to detail, um, which is often required in this industry. Kind of, you know, yes, you need to have your kind of flowery words that make you sound like the most awesome person ever in your CV, um, but there's only so much you can say, just show me. We primarily work in a visual medium, no matter you know, where that niche is. Um, show me and, and give me real world examples of how, you, how you've done this amazing stuff. Um, I, I, one of the, my personal kind of things when recruiting, I always ask for a cover letter because that shows that one, you're not just firing off a load of automatic kind of responses to all the jobs. You've actually taken the time 
you're as interested in this job as the person who's kind of reading that CV on the other side, and just try and make it personal, show that you've done your research, show that actually this job could mean something to you, and that will really kind of start that, that relationship, start that rapport. Um, so I'd say do not underestimate the power of a good cover letter. It doesn't have to be long, it can be one paragraph, but just to literally show the name of the company and spell it right. <laughs> Don't just kind of copy and replace and get it slightly wrong, which happens quite a lot. Um, go that extra mile, attention to detail, and just start to make that personal connection. Because you know, people invest in people. It's a cheesy thing, but they, they do. It is all about those human relationships. And even if you're not the best technically, and you know, after three years in education or whatever, you, you're not necessarily going to be the best. Um, but a good personality, good kind of human skills goes a really long way. Um, to help that employee to see that potential in you. Um, like most of you um, are going to be dependent on on your showreel, really, um, when you're applying for jobs, you've got to kind of you've got to do it quick. Don't make me wait for your best shots. Just show me all the good stuff, because like you might only get 10, 20, 30 seconds of someone actually watching your showreel. If you've got this kind of epic five-minute showreel, I'm probably not going to get to the end of it. So just show it me up front, show me your good stuff. And if you've got some other stuff that you still think is really good, then put it in, but it, put it towards the end. But have that confidence in showcasing uh, your best work, because that is what is going to get you that job. Um, showreel is really important, but uh, I often find that a couple of um, still images as well really helps to kind of imprint um, that person in amongst the 100 CVs that you're reviewing, just having those kind of um, really strong um, reference images helps to uh, build that connection to that person that kind of brings it alive off the, off the CV. I'm not a fan of um, software skill infographics or whatever they're called. Um, just tell me what you're great at and then kind of list the other stuff. Unless there's some kind of new EU legislation which standardize what all these different kind of charts and little circles and pie charts kind of mean, um, it is of no value to me. It doesn't mean anything. Um, just tell me what you're good at and then give me an example of it and show me how you're good at it. Um, Self-critique is kind of probably one of the most useful things in any creative industry. You know, knowing when something isn't right, being able to spot that yourself and then figure out how to make it better. That is the difference between, you know, essentially someone who's going to be more of an art worker and someone's going to be a, a creative director. If you want to kind of really kind of progress in your career, you need to have that, crit that, crit that ability to kind of be really critical with your own work um, and then figure out how to make it better or how to work with your peers and your colleagues to make it better collectively. Um, if you're sending off a job application, uh, get a good reference, like get a couple of good references, get your tutor or whoever to write you a reference. It doesn't have to be long, but I don't want to go searching for references. I just want to see it there and then. I want to make a decision, like, is this person being endorsed by someone who I, I will respect? Um, just include it. Don't ask me to kind of go and ask for it at a later date. Consistency. Be consistent, attention to detail, um, get people's names right, get company names right. Um, because that, like being, being a pedant, anyone who's working in the, a kind of a technical discipline, it's absolutely critical as soon as you go into a group environment that you, are, um, you follow that pipeline and you don't kind of step out of that workflow. So show that in your application as well. That shows that you will be a good kind of... A, have that good technical discipline as well in your work and your approach. And, and highlight that to employees. To hear, like having a conversation about someone about how they, like file naming system or something like that, says a lot about a person. So final, final, oh, one, this is the final one. If that is kind of in, on your PDF for your cover letter, that doesn't kind of shine a good light on you. Um, I've said it, but just try and show that potential. Um, it's hard to articulate what I mean by that, but when I'm, put, when I'm putting graduates into junior roles, I just want to see that kind of glimmer of potential, and I will latch onto that and then invest in that person. And that's my time up. I think I've nearly done. Oh, yeah, don't be a psycho. <laughs> um, I think that's quite self explanatory. Um, and, you, you know, you, you do have some power in this situation as well. You know, an employer, they are 
they are looking to fulfill a role. They're probably in a stressful situation. They've probably got more work than they can handle. Um, so they do need you. So kind of, you know, use that power. It, it is a two-way um, conversation. So don't be afraid to, um, you know, be assertive. Um, and you do hold some of the power in that situation. It's not a one-sided situation. Um, I kind of, I often, in terms of kind of long-term careers, um, I've nearly done for the timekeepers. Um, I think about often kind of these patterns kind of emerge between kind of three months a year and three years in terms of like how long you may stay at a company and things like that. So they're kind of like critical points and anyone's kind of starting out and making those kind of life choices kind of if you don't have a five year or a 10 year plan in where you want to be, start with these kind of steps because they will kind of naturally fit into the rest of your life and just think about your career and your life. You know, where do you see yourself from this point? Um, and constantly refresh that and keep that update in your mind about where you want to be. Yeah, VR, AR, and MR is the future of everything. So um, take an interest. It's quite technical at the moment. Um, it's quite a high barrier to entry. A lot of the toys are quite expensive. Um, but it's definitely going to be a prolific, ubiquitous, kind of game-changing technology. So if you have an opportunity to to experiment with, you know, grab a copy of Unity, kind of make some AR stuff if you've just got a smartphone, if you've got access to a VR headset, play with that as well. Um, it is definitely going to be a big part of the landscape over the next um, 10 years. Um, at the minute, it's quite hard to actually make money in it, um, but it's you guys kind of coming through that will be making the experience of the future. Um, so definitely don't ignore it, get involved with it. And that's it from me. Thank you. Any questions? Um, mixed reality. So things like Microsoft HoloLens, things like that. So if, yeah, there's lots of different terminology. But I class mixed reality as kind of glasses-based augmented reality, where augmented reality would be more like an iPhone or a tablet, where it's kind of at arm's length. So it's all perspective correct, but it's not on you, at the same eye point as you. So my version of it. Anybody else? No? Okay. Well, thank you very much for that. Thank you. Thank you.